everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the inaugural OND Research Webinar. My name is Laura Jager. I am the Acting Associate Director of the OND Research Program. I want to thank you for taking the time to attend today's event. This is a really exciting day for me and my team because this is the first time OND is organizing a public webinar to highlight our office's research portfolio. We recognize that before today, many of you probably didn't even know that the Office of New Drugs conducts research. Today is our first step towards changing that narrative. Although the primary role of OND is to conduct review of investigational and new drug applications, while conducting this work, our staff sometimes identify knowledge gaps that make it difficult and in some cases impossible to obtain the data that we need to support new drug approvals. This is when OND research occurs. We call this type of research regulatory science research. Although our OND review staff tends to take the lead on identifying the knowledge gaps that give rise to our office's research projects, much of OND's research is actually conducted with the help of our OND research fellows or our external collaborators. That's where you come in. I'm the first speaker on the agenda today, so my goal is just to give you an overview. But don't, don't doze off, please. Pay attention, the background piece is really important. Once you understand these concepts, the how, the why of OND research, you'll be better prepared to apply for the opportunities that will be advertised to you in the three talks that are coming up after me. As part of my overview, in the next few slides, I'll introduce you to my team, the OND Research Program. Next, I'll define regulatory science research, give you several actual examples of research topics, and finally, I'll provide information about the amount of money OND is planning to invest in research in fiscal year 21, and I'll tell you where we're gonna put it. Together, all of this information should give you the context you need to be able to collaborate with us. I'm sure you're all very eager to get this show on the road, so I'll quit rambling and I'll go right into my next slide. On this slide, I'm showing you an organizational chart of OND, or the Office of New Drugs. I just wanna share this to give you a sense of the breadth of subject matter expertise that's housed within our office. Not surprisingly, our research portfolio is also reflective of this diversity in terms of topics that projects are designed to address. So I guess my take home message here is that in OND, there's something for everyone when it comes to topics for research projects. OND consists of 27 review divisions that are organized into eight sub offices. And as you can imagine, these 27 review divisions have a really big job so they can't function successfully on their own. Because of that, OND contains several support offices that are responsible for keeping our review divisions running seamlessly. On this slide, uh, I'm showing the organizational structure of OND's support of offices. You're probably not surprised to see that there are groups who are responsible for supporting OND's administrative program and regulatory operations. But the thing you may not have realized before today is that there are groups in OND who are responsible for providing technical expertise in areas that cross disciplines. Many of these groups are housed within an OND sub office called the Office of Drug Evaluation Sciences, or OTIS for short. As you can see here, OTIS contains four technical support groups with expertise in the areas of clinical outcomes assessment, biomedical informatics, biomarker qualification, and research. That's where my team comes in. Research is a really broad term, so you might be wondering, what does it mean to have technical expertise in research? Well, I'm gonna address that in the next slide. Although my team is called the OND Research Program, this name is just a little bit misleading because we aren't the people who actually do the research in OND. Instead, my team is responsible for supporting the OND staff who want to conduct research projects. The support we provide takes a lot of forms. We do things like develop infrastructure, streamline processes, and creating educational content. But at the end of the day, all of these efforts, the goal is pretty much the same. 
we want to make sure that OND staff have what they need to be able to conduct successful research projects. We're kind of a behind the scenes research facilitator in that respect. The second reason OND launched a research program back in 2018 was to facilitate oversight for our office's research spending. I'll talk about this more in the next few slides, but the thing you need to understand is that the funding OND receives to conduct research is nowhere near what a research driven agency like the National Institute of Health or NIH receives. Now, don't get me wrong, um, our office's regulatory science research portfolio is very large and incredibly diverse. This makes a lot of sense based on the breadth of experience or expertise housed within OND, but in order to maintain or even grow our research portfolio, OND needs to make sure that we are investing very strategically. Like I mentioned before, the type of research conducted at FDA is called Regulatory Science Research, or RSR for short. The purpose of RSR is to generate outcomes that will help FDA get better at accomplishing our mission of evaluating safety and efficacy of medical products. FDA funds a limited amount of RSR every year because although the knowledge gaps identified may be of interest to other scientific agencies like the NIH or the CDC, the research outcomes for our research are very mission specific to FDA. So for example, a potential outcome of an FDA funded RSR project would be to write a guidance that would give sponsors advice on how to conduct more efficient clinical trials to evaluate new drugs for a given disease. Essentially, these outcomes mostly benefit FDA. So at the end of the day, that's why we pay for the research to obtain them. Another point to consider is that in OND, our RSR is based on very targeted research questions that can be addressed quickly. Our office's research portfolio is large and diverse, and the project ideas just keep on coming, but our RSR funding levels generally remain about the same every fiscal year. In order to address as many knowledge gaps as possible, OND tends to pursue projects that can be completed quickly. What I mean by quickly is projects that can be finished in less than four to five years max. This is a little different than the way that the NIH may fund projects because NIH is designed to fund basic science research. Basic science research is important and it's foundational to our scientific understanding of the universe. Unfortunately, FDA doesn't have the time or the resources uh, to conduct basic science research. It also does not align with our mission. Um, instead, we focus on funding time-limited RSR projects designed to address targeted questions that, once answered, will produce some sort of outcome that FDA will be able to use right away to help us to do our job better. This level of focus is really what differentiates RSR from other types of scientific research. It's important for you, our potential future collaborators, to understand this context because it helps set the tone and better defines your expectations for how and where you might play a role in a potential RSR project. Now, I've talked quite a bit about RSR in abstract terms, but on this slide, I'd really like to go into the weeds a little bit more and give you specific uh, concrete examples of OND funded RSR to help really just solidify these concepts for you in your mind. In general, OND RSR efforts can be lumped into two major categories, which I've included on this slide. An actual example of category one would include a project OND funded to look at data submitted in new drug applications to compare information that was collected across applications to, in an effort to identify trends in the data that could be used to support updates that OND was proposing to make to our safety monitoring policies. So in this particular example, OND used information that we already had available in-house to conduct a meta-analysis to determine the actual frequency of safety events that were occurring. We used the results we obtained to support an update to our drug evaluation policy. Pretty straightforward. 
An O&D example from category two would include a project that collected real world data from electronic health records to help O&D understand the natural history of a disease in a population that was receiving the standard of care. O&D recognized in this case that although there was no drug to treat the disease in question, patients were still receiving a level of supportive care from their doctors. We wanted to make sure that we were modeling that care appropriately in the control group for the clinical trial designs that we were recommending. In this specific example, OND repurposed existing real world data in the form of patient health records. Um, and we used that to uh, better inform the structure of our control group. This is in this way, we created a tool that ultimately streamlined OND evaluation of drug safety and efficacy. So you might be asking yourself, what, what, why so much emphasis on data mining? Well, this is because OND has limited resources to conduct RSR. So we have to be creative. We have to think of ways to address questions efficiently without spending an enormous amount of money. The primary way we do this is by leveraging pre-existing data sets. But don't get me wrong, there are exceptions. And OND, OND does sometimes fund laboratory-based research and limited clinical studies. And you will hear more about those in the talks that will be given later today as part of the webinar. Before I hand the baton to the other speakers, though, I want to leave you with one last bit of information. In this slide, I included a graphic that shows you the actual amount of funding OND is planning on committing to RSR in fiscal year 21. As you can see here, the funding goes into two large buckets. Now that's because OND RSR funding is typically used to either fund research fellows who conduct mentor led projects on behalf of our review staff um, through our OND ORISE program, or the RSR funding is used to fund research efforts that must be conducted outside of OND because our office needs access to expertise, tools, or data that we just don't have available here at FDA. We refer to these particular types of projects as extramural research because although OND is leading the effort and funding the effort, ultimately the research is conducted with the help of partners who are external to FDA. Now onto the slides that focus on what we can do for you. Well, on this slide, um, I want to advertise that OND has research fellowships available through our ORES program. As I mentioned before, OND invests quite a lot of money into our OND ORES fellowship program. Currently, we have around 40 ORES fellows conducting research. This program is designed to bring trainees on board to provide support for RSR projects. It's also a really great professional development opportunity for early career investigators. What I mean by early career investigators is either uh, college students who are currently enrolled or recent college graduates. If you fall into one of these buckets and you're interested in learning more about the OND ORISE fellowships that are currently available, please stay tuned for our next speaker, Michelle Danamir. Michelle is our center level liaison for the ORISE program, and in her talk, she'll be giving you more specific information such as ORISE program requirements, where to identify opportunities that are currently available, and how best to apply for them. So stay tuned for that information. In this slide, I am flagging for you that we have, OND has collaborative RSR opportunities available for external investigators and we have funding to support those collaborations. We have two speakers today who are heads of efforts to conduct extramural research geared towards addressing specific initiatives. The two initiatives that you'll learn about today are the CARB program and the 21st Century Cures DDT grant program. Yushi Amini will be talking to you about CARB and Chris Leptak will give you information you need to learn uh, to apply for opportunities through the 21st Century Cures program. Both of these programs have funding available for external collaborators who can help support these projects. So again, if this is of interest, please stay tuned to learn more about how and where you can get involved. I've included this slide uh, as a summary of some publicly available resources, just in case you're, you're interested 
in learning more about RSR and you want to take a deeper dive. These links provide information on ongoing efforts in CEDAR. Um, they highlight specific projects. Uh, one of the links gives you more information on various fellowships available. I've also included a link to our OND homepage so you can get a better sense of who we are. Uh, feel free to have a look at these when you have some free time. On this last slide, I'd like to make a call to action. I hope that uh, this talk has motivated you to think about applying for the opportunities that are going to be described by the speakers coming up after me. I included this slide because we want you to know we're glad you're here and we really do hope this is the beginning of a fruitful collaboration that will benefit both of us. Um, the path to success is a lot less lonely when you're joined by your friends, so please join us. We would love to succeed together. And with that, I will close out my talk. And one last time, I'd love to thank you for attending our webinar today. Thank you, Dr. Yeager, for that wonderful call to action. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle DeNamer, and I am the fellowship liaison for the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. I am so excited to be here today and sharing with you about CEDAR's training development program operated via ORISE and to examine how you can engage with us and become interested and apply for those opportunities that might be available. ORISE stands for the Oak Ridge Institute for Science and Education, and it is operated by the Oak Ridge Associated Universities under a contract with the Department of Energy. We have an agreement with the Department of Energy to operate just one component of that program, and it's specifically for training and research. Now, later on, if you go look, you will see that ORISE and ORAO are much larger programs, and they do a lot. They have grown exponentially since they were first created in the wake of World War II. And they came about because there was a group of scientists who were engaging with nuclear research and they wanted to find a way to advance that science and collaborate with each other and train younger generations into how to do the research responsibly. So there were a group of researchers at various universities who came together to form a consortium to make sure that that research advanced. Now the program has expanded into an educational program related to all sciences, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and it helps the U.S. government advance our STEM education programs. So the program itself at CEDAR is created for education and development of STEM-related training so we hope to offer individuals real world opportunities to engage with the hands on research conducted at CEDAR and within the government. So you are going to be working in a specific project, looking at and examining those type of questions related to that research, as well as working with the mentors and employees at CEDAR who are able to guide and shape that research and provide direction. We hope that you become interested in the mission of CEDAR and the public health mission overall by research and engagement with our program. We are able to offer very competitive stipends to support living expenses within this program. So although you do not become a government employee or an employee of ORISE during the time of your engagement, you are getting real world and hands-on experience to enhance your career. And the stipends that we support, provide are supported by what educational level you have already attained. So um, you are able to very comfortably live in the Washington DC area with the stipends that are provided. We also provide access to training and travel opportunities that might enhance the project that you're working on. The program is designed as an in-residence on-site program. And the reason for this is so that you can engage with uh, individuals throughout the center and throughout the agency to help develop your career and advance your own professional goals. The program is a training program, so it is limited to five years. 
However, lots of individuals during that time are able to form different connections and gain experience that helps them in their career development. So um, we hope that it would be the same for you. This is a program which is designed for young professionals. So it is designed for individuals who are currently enrolled in a university program here in the United States and pursuing a degree in the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics disciplines. We have been very fortunate at the FDA to also expand that to include the regulatory sciences and public health research. The program is also open to recent graduates. So individuals who have earned a degree within the past five years from a degree certificate or STEM program um, in the United States. Now, what you may not know is that this program is also open to full-time university faculty members in the US. It is ideal for individuals who might be taking a sabbatical or who might be taking a break from teaching activities during a certain period of time. The idea of the faculty appointments is to, to engage faculty with the research that is ongoing within our government programs and within CEDAR so that they can take those experiences to the classroom and provide enriching opportunities and further insight for their students to engage them in the STEM uh, areas as well. So um, we are very excited when faculty members join us and those appointments are limited to one year. Examples of projects that individuals have done in the past include pharmacy comp compounding analysis, looking at the substances that might be able to be effectively compounded. Uh, over the counter drug monograph analysis, looking at the drug monographs that are existing and how those might be updated. Looking at antibacterial resistance or examining fetal exposure to maternal drugs. There's a variety of projects that are available at any given time. And so we would encourage you to look often for the opportunities that you might be most interested in. And if you are interested in something, we would encourage you to contact us. There is information on the website about who to contact with specific questions. Although we do not list the specific mentor's name on the postings, we can always get your question directed to them if you have something specific that you want to ask. So please don't hesitate to contact us with specific questions. Now, if you go to the ORISE program website for FDA, you will see that there are three main areas where you can click. We would suggest that at this time you clicked, I am interested in applying. And under that link, you will find various information about the program itself. Um, it talks about what current applicants are doing, what current um, projects are going on. You'll see some pictures of some individuals who have participated in the past. It will also provide you with information about insurance that might be available to you. Um, through this program if you needed that, um, as well as a link to the various training opportunities. So we would encourage you to take a look at this website and examine it thoroughly. You will also see up on the left-hand corner where it says Seeking Research Opportunities Apply Now. If you click there, it will take you to the Zintelect system to apply for opportunities and search the opportunities that are currently available. You can also go to the site directly by typing http www.zintelect.com in your browser. Once you're there, you will see a section designated for applicants on the left hand side. And under that section, you can search on keywords that might be of interest to you. So once you've entered that in the box, you simply click on go. So for this one, I've searched maternal drugs and I found that it resulted in one open opportunity right now. If you click on the title for this opportunity, it's going to give you a detailed description of what the project is about and where it's located. Now you will notice 
that this opportunity in particular was posted in September and the application deadline is next March. Within CEDAR, our opportunities are typically posted for a six to nine month period. However, we review the applications on a rolling basis and we do make offers as we find individuals who are well matched. So once an opportunity is posted, if you are interested, we would encourage you to apply. Um, and at that point, if you have specific questions, you can reach out to us and ask us those questions. Another important thing, once you've clicked on the title and reviewed the project, if it looks interesting to you, scroll down to the bottom. This is where you will find the specific eligibility requirements for that opportunity. For this one, you see that it's open to individuals in various degree levels, bachelor's, master's, doctoral degree, or if you received one of those degrees within the past five years. It also tells you what disciplines are of specific interest. So if your degree is in one of those disciplines, this might be an opportunity that is well suited for you. Now on the right hand side of each discipline, you see that little eye icon with a number. If you click on that, it will give you more detail within the broad disciplines about specific disciplines. So for example, life, health and medical sciences is pretty broad. But if you clicked on the little eyeball, it might say something such as biological sciences or toxicology. And it would give you some more specifics about what that mentor and project might specifically be looking for. If you think that this is the right opportunity for you, you will click on the apply button. And once you do click on the apply button, it will bring you to a system where you will fill out a series of questions telling us why you're interested in the opportunity, what you feel you could learn, how you're suited to it. You will also upload your transcript and provide the name of two references. These reference individuals will also provide testimony about how you might be well qualified for this particular um, project or opportunity that's out there. The system is electronic. And so your referee should be able to fill out that information within about five to 10 minutes on the electronic form. Once you have created your initial profile in the system, you are able to save the basic information. So if you want to apply to a new opportunity, you simply fill out the questions again, but you do not need to fill out your um, biographic information or degree related information. That should already be stored within your profile. This screen just tells you a little bit about the process on the CEDAR level. And so what we do want our candidates to know is that all of our opportunities are posted in public. There aren't any hidden opportunities. So candidates typically do go through an interview process and are selected by a specific program mentor. Now, as I said a little bit earlier, the program is very competitive. So for example, for our summer program, we usually receive over 500 applications and usually have about 100 spots. So each opportunity is slightly different. And of course, some have more specific eligibility requirements. So your applicant pool might not be as large. But again, we would encourage you to apply for any of the opportunities that you are interested in. Once you do that, you will be contacted upon selection, letting you know that the office wants to move forward. At that point, there are several documents to complete for the FDA, which relate to your background screening and badging. We suggest that you fill these in within three business days of being contacted. Of that being will contacted. allow the process to move that forward will allow in the, the most efficient to move manner. Forward. And um, during that time, and perhaps concurrently, you should get an actual offer letter from ORISE. Now remember o that even though the program is located at CEDAR, we work with ORISE as our collaborative partner, so they will issue any of the appointment letters and answer any administrative questions that you have related to the appointment. We encourage you to read those terms of appointment very carefully and accept the offer. Everything is done via their electronics intellect system. So you will fill out all of your information there. And if you choose to accept the offer, you will accept there as well.
if you choose to decline for some reason, that also happens electronically. So I hope that this provides you with a little bit of insight into how our program is operated and how you can locate the opportunities that you might be interested in. We look forward to seeing applications from you and wish you all the best of luck. Thank you to Laura and Michelle for those great presentations. If you haven't had a chance to enter your questions into the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. We did receive a few questions, and the first question will be going to Laura. The question is, how are ideas for RSR projects generated? Thanks, Ray. This is a good one. Um, so ONP's review staff identify the knowledge gaps while they're conducting their work of reviewing the office. So as an OND reviewer identifies the gap, then they will go ahead and start to create a plan for how they're going to address it. Um, our office, or, or my team, actually created templates that help them figure out exactly what they need to give us to evaluate their project plan. Um, we want to make sure we're giving everyone a level playing field, collecting the same type of information. So we ask them, you know, just basic things like what's the background, what's the gap, how is it relevant to our mission? What's your milestones and expected outcomes? And then um, we evaluate the project and figure out if we want to fund it based on the information that they provide. So um, the short answer is the, the ideas come from our staff within the office. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question for Laura. How does O&D determine what projects will be funded each year? Mm, another good one. Um, so the way that we figure out how to fund projects is in O&D, we set up a committee of internal subject matter experts. Because like I showed you in that um, first slide in my talk, we've got just about every subject matter expertise under the sun in the office. So we set up a committee of experts, and they do an annual peer review of all new and ongoing projects to figure out which are the best possible investments for the office. So this committee, they used um, some predefined evaluation criteria that we created, and they have a look at the project and figure out which of the projects that are being proposed will have the highest potential to create outcomes that will immediately impact us and, and help us do our job better. Um, projects that also would be broadly impactful, um, for example, affect several disease areas, those are also ranked really high priority. So um, we, we use the model kind of like what NIH does. We do a peer review uh, of all uh, funding requests, and we use that to figure out which projects will fund. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question is addressed to Michelle. Can non-U.S. citizens participate in the ORISE program? So that's a great question. And the answer is yes, non-U.S. citizens can participate in the ORISE program. We do have federal badging requirements, which um, do require that individuals resided in the United States for 36 of the past 60 months. And that is something that we are unable to change. But otherwise, individuals who are non-citizens and have work authorization in the United States are able to engage in our programs. Thank you for responding to that question. We have another question for Michelle. How do you recruit students for the ORISE program? How would students normally find out about the internship opportunities? And what is the application process? Do you only select students from the DMV area? 
Wow, lots to unpack there, but um, great questions. Uh, we do uh, very active recruitment efforts, both with our partnership with the ORISE organization in Tennessee through various university networks, such as um, Handshake. Uh, we will post opportunities that are a little bit more difficult to find on uh, LinkedIn. And we also go to a wide variety of recruitment fairs every year throughout the country for um, STEM-related programs. Now, during uh, the pandemic response, that has indeed been a lot more limited. But one of our goals is to have broad um, information about this available in diverse geographic areas of the country. So we're very happy to share or do presentations uh, for universities that might request it. Um, and we are happy to get applicants from all over. Um, it adds really rich variety to our program. Um, I'm going to see if I can remember the rest of that question um, about um, the application process. Um, so the application process is, right now is that individuals can apply for as many of the opportunities as they are qualified and interested in. And the Zintelect system will actually tell a candidate if they are not qualified for a specific opportunity based on their degree or their education. Otherwise, our mentors um, do review the applications that are in the system. It will ask a series of questions about why you're interested in that opportunity, what you think you might gain from it. And then there is certain standard information that is stored in a profile. Um, that would be information related to the degree that you earned, the courses you did, uh, your transcript and your resume. And um, those can be, be applied to any of the opportunities you are posting to. It will simply ask you to answer the project-specific questions on each application. But there is no limit as far as how many applications you can make. So we've, we've seen some people apply to 10 or 15 opportunities before they were selected. We've seen other people who only applied to one. And it really depends on the fit to that particular project. So I hope that got the question. But if not, um, please let us know. Thank you for responding to that question. Our next question is addressed to Laura. Are RSR collaborators typically from industry or academia? A little bit of both. Um, in general, um, OMD collaborates, I would say, primarily with academia just because um, it's a little more fluid, the types of questions they want to ask. Um, obviously, our collaborators in industry, um, they're more focused on trying to get what they need to get to get that drug approved um, and get it out there. So it's kind of a different spin on things. Um, folks in academia, um, just in general, seem to be more attracted to the types of questions we're grappling with. But we honestly collaborate with all kinds of folks. Um, so I don't want to say one way or the other. Thank you for responding to that question. We have another question for Laura. Does the breakdown of funding between ORISE fellowships and extramural projects change from year to year? Um, yes, it does. Uh, so as I kind of talked to you this a little bit before, we as a committee to evaluate the project. So it's a, it's a very committee-driven portfolio. Um, we, we don't know what's going to come in every year, but it comes from our ground up, goes through the committee, um, and the most promising projects are what moves forward. So the breakdown can shift depending on where the most promising projects are heading. Um, so it, it does kind of ebb and flow. Thank you for responding to that question. Our next question is addressed to Michelle. What disciplines are usually selected for the ORISE program? For instance, would someone with a graphics design or communications background be eligible? 
or is it primarily students and graduates, the science or healthcare background? So a great question. It is primarily designed for individuals who have science, technology, and engineering um, mathematics backgrounds. Uh, the majority of our participants do usually have some sort of um, pharmacy background or healthcare or public health type background. We do have some healthcare communications and web content related type projects which examine how we communicate those health messages. Um, but the primary disciplines would be science, technology, engineering, and mathematics um, disciplines. Thank you for responding to that question. This may be our last question, and this is also addressed to Michelle. Are there any benefits like health insurance and other things that are available to ORISE participants? Absolutely. ORISE does offer an optional health insurance program via Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee. And starting in 2021, we'll also offer an optional dental and vision insurance coverage program. Um, those are typically supplemented by our uh, investigators so that uh, participants are able to purchase the insurance um, at a lowered cost. And, but participants are able to purchase from any insurance provider. And insurance is required for participation in this research program. That being said, um, throughout the year, we do have public health efforts that are done by FDA. And for example, our annual flu shot program is available free of charge to our ORISE participants. Thank you to Laura and Michelle for answering the questions that came in. It's our pleasure to introduce our next panel of speakers, 